So what is Jesus doing in a time of crisis? Because he's our example, isn't he? So let's go to John chapter 11. Verse 21. Lazarus died. That's a shame. Sorry. <laughs> but it is a shame. Because he was a friend of Jesus. And when your friends die, it's not nice. It's a sad thing. Even when they are born again, it's still sad. But it's because it's not the way God pretended to be for us. We, uh, he made mankind to live forever. Adam and Eve should live forever. Because we choose against God, we have to die. And in that life, we have the opportunity to live forever or not. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you have been here, my brother would have not died. Do you recognize that in your own life? In your situations in your life, maybe at the present or in the past, that you were in situations that, that you said to the Lord, only if you have, would have been here, you could have saved me. Why didn't you show up in my life? I think we all know those situations in our lives. Maybe you're sitting here tonight that you are in a situation that you're calling out, crying out to God, Lord, please, where are you in Jesus' name? I need you. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, you will, God will give you. So Martha had some faith in Jesus. Because she thought and knew that Jesus was the favorite of God. And if Jesus would ask something from God, God will, would do it. So that's already a great step in faith that she had. And an understanding of the fact who Jesus was. She was halfway. The revelation. And it's an amazing thing. Because a lot of Christians are not that far. But it's a wonderful thing. So Jesus said to her. My, your brother will rise again. That's a nice prophetic word. So if you are in difficult circumstances. And God. And that's why we need church. That's why we need to allow the Holy Spirit to flow. In situations in lives. That's why we come together. That God can speak life over situations and people. So Jesus is saying to her, your brother will rise again. That's a nice prophetic word. It gives you hope. It gives you faith, isn't it? If I feel in God, by the Holy Spirit, you've got a gift. And God says, please, for my sake, do something with it. Stand up and do something with the gifting that I trusted in you. It's a wonderful thing because God says, I already empowered you. The only thing that you have to do is, is walk in your gifting. Make yourself available in this church to walk in your gifting. I prophesy over you. Life. That's amazing. It's promising. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Sorry for my English. So she had faith in the fact that in the end, in the last day, God will raise up everybody that died. But that's not faith for this life. That's faith for the last day. So see, you can see she understood Jesus halfway. Because we all know that we will stand up out of the dead one. When Jesus is coming back, he will take his bride. And we will, wherever we are at that moment, we will rise from the dead, Amen. our bodies, and we will receive a new body. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. So her faith was halfway. Jesus said to her, but here comes the revelation. I am the resurrection and life. So Jesus is trying to bring that revelation, that prophetic word, who he is, across to her. I am the resurrection. I am the life. It wasn't said before. And it's a very important that we see and that people here around us in the world that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Amen? 
Whoever believes in me, though he died, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. That's wonderful, huh? That's such a comfort wo word for all of us. Like we were sharing this morning, we are a new creation. He gave us the power to become his child. And that's amazing. We are his masterpiece, but we are already living forever. We're not dying. Our body is going to die one day, but my soul, my spirit is not dying anymore. So I don't have to fear death anymore because the moment I die, I will be with Jesus Christ and live forever. There will be a day that I will receive my new body. Hallelujah. I see a lot of smiles now. <laughs> You're also looking forward to that one. <laughs> or is it just me? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. So now she's making a very important proclamation. Yes, Lord. That word Lord is Yahweh. And it, it, so it takes me too much time, but you have to study what it means, the word Yahweh. It means that he's our provider, our identity, our prof all we need is in Yahweh. So it's your study, your responsibility for this week to do. But in the same time, she says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God that was promised. So she makes a faith proclamation that's bigger than the first one. And it's an amazing thing. So you can see faith is growing step by step. And Jesus is, is, is helping us to grow in the faith in him. But that's what the world needs. They need us to help them to grow step by step, to receive revelation on revelation on revelation, to meet Jesus Christ, to be able to accept him. Verse 38. Now Lazarus is four days dead. So the situation is not only a problem, but it's in our thinking, the end of the story. When somebody, and the situation is really dead, dead. So, 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, because he, Jesus feels what you feel. When you've got pain, he feels your pain. When you are sad, Jesus feels that sadness, because he is our high priest. He can feel with us in every aspect of life. Isn't that a comfort word? He, can, he, he will cry with you, and he will laugh with you. That's my Jesus. I hope it's your Jesus. He will laugh with you. He will cry with you. He's so close to you. He's not far away. Even in difficult circumstances, he's close to you. Always. And he knows what's going through your life. He's, he knows what's going through your emotions and feelings. He knows. And he is able to cry and laugh with you. Jesus feels again, is moved again deeply came to the tomb, and it, it was a cave, and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Why is Jesus not taking the stone away himself? Did you ever thought about that? He could say to the stone, move. To whom did Jesus say, take away the stone? To whom? To the people that were standing around Martha and Maria and the family and friends. So what is Jesus doing? He's including mankind in his wonders and in his works. He's including people. Isn't that amazing? So Jesus is actually saying to, in a situation, and I'll explain it later, you roll the stone away. I will explain it later. Martha said the sister, the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there, is, there will be an odor. Not a nice one. You know, probably in all your life too, and in some situations and some relations, when there is no solution and stuff is not happening and you are so desperate and it takes too long that God is coming to you, the smell around you is not nice anymore. When bitterness is in your heart, unforgiveness, the smell around you is not nice. 
sometimes with some people, I don't know if you experienced it before, but sometimes you can smell them a mile away <laughs> by their heart attitude and something that they in the scary in their spirit. It's an odor that you don't like. And sometimes you walk and talk with people and then afterwards you say, I don't know what it was, but didn't smell right. I can see you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Some conversations, you walk away with a smell in your nose that you think, hey, that was weird. It wasn't nice. For he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So sometimes in life, we, we, we're facing difficulties. And we're praying and crying out to God, and he's waiting. And then our faith is diminishing, and sometimes we're losing faith. And God says, didn't I tell you, if you keep on believing me, you would see my glory? I think quite often we give up too quickly. Way too quickly. Because we try to determine when God has to do what. Sure. It's not the way it works in the kingdom of God. He's in control. He's Lord. He's Christ. We have to kneel like we were singing. We will kneel for him. Obey him. Because he's the king of kings. And he's controlling everything and he knows what's best for you. Even when we think that we know what's best for us. That's not the case. And if we keep on believing, like I can, I can use a few examples. In our church, God planted the church 20, 22 years ago, and he was, every time we received prophetic words that we are a base church, we will plant churches. You know, after f 15 years, 12 years, we didn't plant the church. 12 years. That's a long time. So some of the guys, good leaders in the church, came. I, I remember one guy came to me and said, Hey, Gert, when on earth are we going to do what God prophesied over us? When are we going to plant churches? Isn't it time? Because we talk already so long about planting church because God is prophesying over us and promising us that we will plant churches. When on earth are we going to plant out? I said, you know, I don't know. I only know one thing. God gave us that promise. So we have to wait on his timing. We have to prepare ourselves to be able to plant churches. That's our responsibility, to be prepared, to prepare myself, to prepare the church. Because one day he will open the door and we have to be ready to go out. To see the glory of God. And we experienced opposite things. Instead of planting other stuff happened. I'm not going into that, <laughs> those details. And then you're screaming out to God, how on earth is this possible? We were growing to a place to be able to plant, and then we have an implosion instead of an explosion. Of planting, it was imploded. And I can tell you at that point, a lot of things went downhill. And I didn't know how to cope with all that stuff. At the end of a few weeks, months, there was only one thing, only one thing that kept me standing. And it was the prophetic promise of God. It was the only thing. Because we were at a point to hand over, walk away, and go away, and leave church behind, almost leave God behind, because sometimes you go through phases, it's too hard to cope with. But there was only one thing that kept me standing, us standing, was the promises and the prophetic words that we received from God, deep in our heart. So Jesus is saying to Martha, didn't I tell you that if you, would, if you keep on believing, you would see the glory of God? To tell you, we are planting churches now, the church is growing, we've got nice leaders, good leaders, uh, guys that will also be in time planting churches and leading churches. So 
God is fulfilling his promises. It only, only took a little bit longer than we thought. Faithfulness as a Christian is one of the best qualities you can have in leaders and, and Christians. Faithfulness. Stand fastness. Endurance. Amen? Because I can see it in marriages. They break up quite quickly today. Because they're losing faith. And they don't see the glory of God over their marriage. So they took the stone away. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this in account of the people standing around me, that they may believe that you have sent me. So Jesus is using this situation to make the people know that he is Lord and that he is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So people can see and hear, and he's proving that he is the Son of God. When he said these, these things, he cried out with a loud voice. Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out in his hands and his feet bounded with linen stripes and his face wrapped with clothes, clots. And Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Why did Jesus not unbind him? He's including people. Again. He's including us. To enjoy... The, the miracles of God. That's God's intent always been. To include us to do miracles, to do wonders. Because he's, he's, he experienced himself so much joy if we work together with God and we allow God to work with us and not know we are working with God. And, he allow, and, and he's inviting us every time to be part of the miracles that he wants to do. Isn't that amazing? I think it's a huge privilege because it gives him joy, but it gives also you and me a lot of joy if we see that God is doing miracles and is using us to set people free. Amen. It's a m wonderful thing. But I want to come back to the fact that Jesus is crying out. Jesus is crying out over this city. Speaking a loud voice. So let's go to the three principles out of this part of Scripture. God wants to include us to, stake, to take the stones away of the hearts of people. As long as the stone is in front of the grave, Lazarus can't hear the voice of Jesus. Amen? So, Maybe in your life, and else you will know some people, life will harden hearts, isn't it? So there are a lot of people that have stones in front of their heart. And Jesus is telling to the church, roll the stone away. Roll the stone away. My children, roll the stone away in the lives of people that you know. Maybe family members, maybe colleagues, maybe neighborhood, people in your neighborhood. Roll, how do you roll a stone away? Showing them the love of Christ. Because I know for one thing, my upbringing was not happy clappy. So I taught myself to build a brick wall around my heart. To protect myself. Do you recognize that in your own life? How high was your wall? <laughs> My wall was quite thick. <laughs> Ask my wife. When we met, I couldn't care if somebody would fall dead in, just beside me. I wouldn't care. My heart was so cold and stone that I could hardly feel any emotions. 
But you know what broke the wall? Living water, the love of God, creeped under the wall into my heart. And the moment my heart became alive again, he broke the walls away. But love from his children, through his children. I remember I was in a situation so desperately that God gave me the opportunity through a Christian to show God's love through him in words of wisdom so that the love could creep under my wall into my heart slowly. So I came to the point that I knew that God said, I, I'm gonna, I, I want to do something in your life. So I went to somebody I knew. I said, can you help me? She said, no, it was a lady. She said, I can't help you, but I know a guy that can help you. He's a good Christian, a mature Christian, and he can help you. So she said, oh, this is the guy. This is his name. I said, no, I'm not going there. I'm not doing that one. I know him. I don't do that. So give me another name. So she gave me another name, so I found the guy. So he said, please explain, explain what's happening, what happened in your life, etc., and what's your situation. So I told a little bit in five minutes my life story. He said, gee, that will take months. That's a <laughs> lot of work. Actually, I'm not able to, tell you, to spend so much time on you, so sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> gee. <laughs> so I went back to the lady. I, he wasn't able to help me. Uh, firstly, I was shocked that he <laughs> made a remark that my problems were so big. <laughs> Maybe it was a blind spot, I don't know. <laughs> so I said, please give me another guy. I go to that one that I mentioned the first time. No, no, I'm not going there. Mm -mm, I know him. Okay, I give you another name. So I found a guy. So I sa he said again, also. So tell me a little bit about your history, where you come from, what happened in your life. So I told him in five minutes. He said, gee, I'm a counselor, but I know this is going to take a long time. <laughs> this is quite serious. <laughs> and actually, I'm just coming out of a burnout situation, and I'm just recovering, so I'm not <laughs> able to help you. <laughs> How do you want, you know... I almost became depressed <laughs> by all those things. <laughs> I was already in a pro I had already problems, but this ma almost made, made it bigger. My goodness. So I went back to the lady, please, do you have somebody else? She said, no. But God had spoken, this is your opportunity. Okay. Tried it once. <laughs> tried, it, tried it twice. So then I have to go to the first guy. So I found a guy that I didn't want to go to. I said, you know, uh, she recommended, recommended you to me to help me. Can you help me? He said, what, what's the problem? Can, uh, before, don't tell me. Just come to, me, to my house, have a cup of coffee, then you can tell me. So come to my house, please, at 8 o'clock. But I was, hey, I was a baker yeah. early up in the morning. One o'clock or three o'clock in the morning. So I know what God is doing in the morning. <laughs> I was a baker for 18 years. So I know what it is to work day and night. So I had to, I had to go out of bed around three o'clock in the next morning. So I came to his house eight o'clock and he wasn't there. She, he had two wonderful girls and he gave me a cup of coffee. Sitting in the lounge, waiting. 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. I thought, my goodness, I have to go home because I want to sleep at 9, 9.30. So I came home because I left. I thought, my goodness. You know, sometimes the situation is you are desperate and you're crying out to God. And you know he wants to help you, but you have to wait for the, certain, the right time and the right moment. But sometimes you, you don't understand what God is doing. And sometimes you've got your own opinion how you want God to help you, like me. <clears throat> but even when you come to the right person, he didn't show up. So I went home and I was very cross. I said to Leah, I'm finished. I give up. I'm not going again. 
I don't know what God is doing, but I'm quitting. Ten minutes later, he's phoning. Hey, Ged. Sorry, can you come? And I changed. I said, I'm coming. So <laughs> on the phone, <laughs> so Leah said to me, what happened? I said, you know, I can't explain it. It's not what he said, but it's the way he said it. God was using him, and he was creeping beneath my wall into my heart. <laughs> so I went, and he helped me for, I, th I think we had only six times having a coffee, sitting, praying, crying, allowing God to deal with stuff in my heart, breaking my wall away. I think before the age of 20, I hardly cried. Yeah, I cried, but it was until my, the age of 15, and then I stopped. Because I knew crying isn't helping. <laughs> so then you harden your heart. And now I can cry any moment. Because God made my heart alive again. And God is wanting us to be people, to love people. So by the love we can roll the stones away from their lives. And you know, when, when we are allowing the Holy Spirit to use us in a way to bring love to people, and it takes time, some months, some years, but love will break the stones and roll the stones away. And God says to you, this evening to us, are you willing to be a rolling stone? No, 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 not that, that, not that one. <laughs> okay, stone rollers. Are you willing... That God is going to use you to roll stones away from hearts of people. It's a nice challenge, huh? Mm. But the ones who are dead need the people around them to bring love, to roll the stones away. So, because what happened after that, then, when the stone is away and the love of God is entering their heart, Jesus is crying and shouting out with their name, a personal call in their life. Whatever the name is, come out. Malcolm, Grant, Brett, whatever you know, come out. Jesus, not you, Jesus is then crying out, shouting out in their life. Do you remember your name that he was shouting your name? calling you out, out of death, into life. Before that, people were working on your life and praying, intercessing. That's a good thing. Because intercession is also something that happens in the spirit that God can, using those people to roll stones away from lives of people. Prayer and practical love, taking care of people, are all subjects that roll stones away. Isn't it amazing? What will roll a stone away? Trustworthiness, honesty, sincere, obedience to the Spirit, love will roll stones away. Because people are deaf. They can't hear. Because there's too much hardness in their heart. I just love it that Jesus is saying uh, uh, that he's cried out with a loud voice. Can you see how much compassion Jesus Christ has over all of us, but also for the lost people? His compassion. He's crying for the lost people. Are we crying with him for the lost people? And then he says, unbind them. When Lazarus came out of, you know, when we are born again, it's not a finished job. Quite often we are bound by a lot of stuff in our lives. By lies, hurts, pain. We are a new creation, but we, are st we still, how do you say it in English? We still wrapped, yeah, we still wrapped with stripes. And then Jesus is not doing a miracle to away freedom. Now he says to the people around, to the church, he says, unwind them. You, unwind them. You unwind them in your home group, in the meetings, prophetic words. Unwind that person, unwind that person, unwind that couple, set them free, speak life over them, and, 
And you know, sometimes it takes so much gentle care to unwind people. But sometimes it just takes a, a little bit more force. But it, the, the income is that Jesus says, you know, I set you free to be free, fully free. But the, I think this is a wonderful picture that God says, you know, I want you to be stone rollers and I will bring them to life. But when I, are, when I call them out, I want to include you again to unbind them from the stripes. And it is a process. So do you recognize that in your own life, when you were born again, you thought, yeah, we are a new creation, but there's still a lot of stuff that we have to get rid of. And Paul is saying it sometimes, you take off those clothes of bad habits. So we need each other to help each other, to correct each other, to, ta to get rid of habits, lies, hurts, pains, all the stuff that we sometimes collecting in life before we died or harden our hearts. As a child, the one that you trust most is your mom. And in my life, my mom was lying. Not once, almost every day. So when I met Leah and her parents, and they were very nice people, loving people, but I couldn't trust them. Because something I was bounded by mistrust because my mom always lied to me. Do you know how long it took me to get rid of that bandage? How I, in the first years, mistreated my wife because I couldn't fully trust her because my mom was somebody that I couldn't trust because she was always lying. It almost broke our marriage. Yep. But we need people around us that are willing to say, Lord, let me be somebody. Qualify me. Gi give me the gifts to unbind and to help people to become free. Like we were sharing this morning, to build a house that's safe, a house of healing, a house to become totally free and healed in our identity and our personality, to walk in the calling of God in our new identity. But we need each other to become free. Amen? Are you willing to be used by God in that way?